The Lord maketh the earth empty. Turn again to Isaiah 24 where we began last week in the first verse. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Some of you know, and as we saw last week, that this verse and similar ones are used by some preachers and some denominations to preach that the world is going to be completely and totally destroyed at some future date. They disagree on the time, but they agree that the world will finally end in complete destruction. In verse 5, after we studied what this really meant, we saw the reason for whatever it is that would happen. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. And by finding out what that verse meant, It was rather easy to prove that whatever this is that is being talked about here, it must be the lands occupied by Israel. For only Israel has the laws and the covenants. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the Hebrew word translated earth and translated land here both are the same, and it must mean the lands inhabited by Israel. And of course, that would mean the United States of America also. We finished last week in Isaiah 29. I didn't quite complete that passage, so I want to uh, finish that. We had read Isaiah 29 verses 9 through 12, which includes verse 10, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. And I believe that is specifically an explanation that the blindness that we see on our leaders, both religious and political, is actually because God has blinded their eyes. They would not have his word, so he has blinded their eyes to his wisdom. And I ask you then if you could give any other reason for the insanity and the confusion we call politics and religion in America than that God has blinded their eyes. They are blind leaders of the blind. We are told by these people in America, for instance, on economics, that our greatest problem is inflation. So they turn around and raise our taxes and our interest, causing more inflation. We are told that Russia is our enemy So we send them food and computers. We are told that drugs are the major cause of crime, and it's almost a certainty that they will soon legalize marijuana. We're told that the schools are not producing good citizens, but that they're coming out of their criminals. So what do they do? They tax us more to build more schools and make education compulsory. And the ministers, by and large, tell us once in a while that Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom on the earth but they tell us all of the time the best thing that can happen to us is to be taken off from the earth none of this really makes any good sense and then in verse 13 God goes on through the prophet Isaiah 29 wherefore so he blinded them and then wherefore the Lord said Forasmuch as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips, do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. And this is literally true. Most professing Christians who attend what we call, or what they call, Christian church in America today, fear God because of false doctrines which they have been taught. The two major ones, of course, being the false doctrine about hell, that if you don't fear God and believe Him, you're going to burn forever in hell, alive in a conscious state. So they fear God because they're afraid He's going to do that to them. Others fear God and confess Christ because they are fearful they might have to spend three and a half or seven years in some sort of a great tribulation as the Antichrist rules over the earth. That is also a false doctrine, and yet men fear God 
just as God says, their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. I have a tabloid-sized newspaper here. Some of you may have seen this. It, in effect, purports to be a newspaper published after the rapture. And it has headlines about uh, ministers meet to discuss a disappearance. Most of their congregation and some of their elders are gone, see? And um, sudden outbreak of violence. Babies and children missing. Hospitals worldwide are amazed because they go in there in the morning and the cribs are empty, see? And then the whole inside is picture after picture of accidents, fires, explosions, and calamities brought about because the drivers of cars disappeared, the pilots of airplanes disappeared, the engineers on trains disappeared, and so on. Even here's a flood because the people that were taking control of the dams and so on disappeared in the rapture, bringing Holocaust to the earth. And then the last page, of course, following the same thing, including a prediction of a worldwide control system which is actually caused, called the beast. And this is all speculation. They have a movie now which is being so shown in churches all over America on this. I don't know how long it is, perhaps 30 to 45 minutes, about the rapture. And some people who saw it have told me that it is a very fearsome thing. And the Baptist church they were in where this movie was shown had quite a lot of people who came down to the pulpit and confessed Christ after they saw the movie about the rapture of the Christians off the earth and the tribulation. And you know, and I know, this is false doctrine. And God here in the prophet says, at this time when the Israel people would draw near with, to him with their mouth, and their heart would be far from him, they would fear him because of false doctrines taught them by men. And it's, of course, come to pass. Now he also says in the next verse, Therefore, or because of all of this, because they would not have God's word, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. That's what we are seeing. Our people are attempting to solve all of the world's problems by investigations and government surveys and private studies and great scientific projects and 16 to 20 years of education for every young man and woman in America. And God says it won't work. He says, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of their wise men. And I believe... That is already happening. And it's happening, why? Because we fear God because of false doctrines. And that's literally true of the great professing church. He goes on, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. Now remember we read in Isaiah 24 and verse 1 that God turneth the world upside down. Here God says man has turned it upside down. What does that mean? That means that our present man system called Babylon in the scripture is upside down according to God's order. Under the present system we find that the rulers oppress the people. Under God's system, the rulers are servants over the people. Under the present system, gold is at the top of all values, men's lives at the bottom. Under God's system, he said, I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Man would be at the top. Under the present system, death reigns. Under God's system, we will have eternal life. Entirely upside down, and God says, Your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as potter's clay. Well, you know the story of potter's clay in Jeremiah. What does it mean? It means God will take this upside down world as a piece of clay in his hands and he will turn it right side up. Now that's what's happening or will happen in the prophetic happenings, I believe, 
of Isaiah 24, when God turns the world upside down, it will end up right side up with God's order. This is not a prophecy of destruction. This is a prophecy of construction, of new creation, turning the world right side up. Let's go back to Isaiah 24 and read on from where we left off. Verse 6, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry-hearted do sigh. The mirth of tabret ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp ceaseth. He is talking of a land, Israel lands, where the mirth and the joy and the pleasure has gone out. Now you think of America and the lands of Israel today. As our economic and political problems increase, we have a nation of fearful people. I read an article about two years ago about an ambassador who had been uh, in foreign countries most of the last 20 years, different countries. He had spent very little time in America, and then he was transferred back to America, and he said that the thing that startled him more than anything else was the change in the American people. As he went out in the shopping centers to fairs out in the public thoroughfares, he saw very few smiling people. America had become a somber nation, a nation that was so hopeful in the late 40s and 50s after World War II has changed into a nation of frightened people who are fearful of the future. And that's what God is describing here, a land that has lost its mirth and its joy. Verse 9, They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up that no man may come in. Now remember, Babylon means confusion. And the city of Babylon is being destroyed. And our people know so little of God's ways, God's system, of economic and political order, that as they see Babylon, or the city of confusion being broken, they are frightened and they are without joy. They do not know what they are seeing. I think our people literally are so dependent upon the present economic order that many of them are going to literally cry as this system is destroyed. How many of them? want to go back to the good old days, right? They want to go back to gold standard for money. They want to go back to the laws that we had 20 and 30 years ago. No, we're not going back into Babylon. We're coming out of Babylon. And unless you understand God's order, you do not see that God is in the process of turning the world back right side up. The old city has got to go. Let's read on. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, in other words, when it will be in the Israel lands like this, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. So, what is happening? This literally is the shaking of the olive tree for the harvest. God is shaking all of the Israel nations of the earth at the time when the vintage is done. In other words, the time of the harvest. In our class before church, we were reading about the harvest at the end of the age and the vintage and the olive tree and the grapes. Israel and the fruit of the harvest is in those words. And this is what God is doing. He's shaking Israel. Turn to Jeremiah 11. I want to be sure you understand that this olive tree is the Israel people. This is another prophecy of Israel in disobedience. We'll start reading in verse 15. Jeremiah 11. What hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. 
The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee planted what? What did God plant? Well, he planted Israel a green olive tree. And he said here, He hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. Here again is a prophecy that this olive tree is going to be shaken because of our sins. Paul knew the Israel people were called olives in the Bible in Romans chapter 11. And this is this passage about the grafting in of the wild olives. Now I know you have always heard it, that this is the grafting in of the Gentiles into the house of Israel. But think with me for just a moment, is it possible that Jesus Christ fulfilled his mission by grafting in believing Christians into the Jews and Judaism? Nonsense. It cannot be what it teaches here. Romans 11, starting in verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree. Now he's writing to these so-called Gentile Christians. He calls them a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. In other words, these people to whom Paul was writing were in the process then, at the time of Paul's ministry, being grafted back into the house of Israel. Now every farmer and horticulturist knows that when you graft trees, you always graft branches from the same species, right? And have you ever tried to graft an apple tree on an orange tree? Or a fir tree? No, you always graft in the same species. And this is what God was doing at the time of Paul. He was grafting in, cast off, and dispersed Israel, called a wild olive, back into the nation of Judah, which was never cast off, the original olive tree. So the ministers are still trying to tell us that we're strange fruit, but we're not. We're the olive tree of Israel also, and we have been grafted in. We're not a different people. We are of the same race. Now go back to Isaiah 24. He says, When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, when all of these things come to pass, when the city of confusion is broken down, when the people have lost the joy and pleasure of the land because everything is being shaken, he says, Then it shall be as the shaking of an olive tree or of Israel, and as the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. And grapes signify, of course, the harvest. And what are they going to do, what are we going to do, when all of these terrible things come to pass? Listen to the next verse. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Not a very sorrowful time, is it? You see, if we see and understand God's word, we have every reason to be glad with all of what the people think are calamities happening upon our people. The disruption of our economic system the disruption and confusion of our political system, even the false doctrines taught in the churches are signs that God is shaking Israel and he's turning the world right side up. Not destroying it, turning it right side up. And of course, that's why Israel, when they see this, will lift up their voice and sing for the majesty of the Lord. Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel in the isles of the sea, from the uttermost part of the earth. And remember, this word is land. We've already seen it must mean 
Israel lands. From the uttermost part of the land have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, My leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously, yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Now I would expect that that verse literally means that our people will not see or understand the treason and the betrayal which has been practiced upon us until we see what God is doing in this land. I know you have tried, I have tried, better people than we are have tried to tell the American people about the traitors and the treason in their government at all levels with little result. And yet here God says when we see what is happening, we will glorify God and we will see that we have been betrayed by whom? Well, by our enemies and by man's ways. We're going to be all done with Babylon by the time God gets us through this thing. In verse 17, he says, Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the land, and it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth or the foundations of the land do shake. Now that verse deserves some comment, because from my mail and from my experience during the last years as I have seen the enemy's conquest being consolidated upon our government and upon our people, many people have tried to figure out some way of saving themselves. Now, one of the last efforts they are making is, what we've been discussing during the last several weeks, is buying gold so you'll have something to hang on to, or doing something that will save you. Now, notice God says, at this time, when Israel begins to see God's hand and begins to see the treason and the treachery, he then warns them that fear and the pit and the snare are upon the inhabitants of this land. In other words, there are dangers of our being trapped because of things that are happening in the land. And he says, if you flee from the noise of the fear, you're going to fall into a pit. And if you get up out of the pit, you're going to be taken in the snare. Every way we try to save ourselves by man's wisdom, man's ideas, and things of Babylon, we'll get out of that and we'll fall for something else. Now remember, gold is a power method in Babylon. Everyone who considers this verse 17 and 18 of Isaiah 24, should listen again to my sermons on gold. I had a man call me, I've had a couple calls, long distance, from people who have, over previous years, invested rather large sums of money in silver and in gold. They heard my sermons and they called me and asked me what they should do. Well, I told them to get rid of it. And if you're going to own anything, at least buy a piece of God's kingdom. At least land, you know, might be worth something. But gold is not. And one man talked to me for an hour on the phone a couple days ago, trying to figure out if I could tell him how long he should keep his gold and when he should sell it. You see, this was the point I made in my series on gold. People will buy gold and greed greed will get them to keep it until it's too late. They'll try to keep it and sell it at the highest figure, convert it to something else, and come out rich. Well, my friend, Christ said it's going to be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I want to tell you one more thing. Jesus Christ told us in the New Testament, literally, 
that the greatest commandment, the two of them were tied together, to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. I would caution you as a professing Christian, if you attempt to buy gold and silver, keep it until it is most valuable, and then sell it, what you're trying to do is to take property away from other people. You follow me? You're trying to sell it to some poor sucker who's then going to lose on it. And that's not Christian. And I believe that God is literally warning His Israel people at this time when we should be praising God if we try to save ourselves through the fear and the pit and the snare they are going to destroy us and we're going to be caught in them. Now I know gold's already gone up $50 an ounce since I preached those sermons, right? And it's probably going to go up several hundred dollars more. And I think it's a snare. And I believe very sincerely that they are going to run that price of gold up until God's people foolishly take real wealth and trade it in for gold and then they're going to knock the price of gold down to nothing. It's a pit and it's a snare. So you be careful. God has warned us. And this is a very, very interesting warning because it is right in the chapter where God says, I'm in the process of turning the world aright. You don't get caught in the snare because it's going to be in the land while I'm doing this. Before I read the last verses in this, I want to read a demonstration of what kind of snares are actually in the land. I stuck this in the file last January 1st. Some of you know this man. The people on the tape ministry won't know it. But his name is Dr. Richard Ireland, and he supposedly has the power of ESP and telling the future. I understand he was and may still be a minister of the gospel. Had quite a church here in Phoenix, and part of his ministry was foretelling the future, reading people's minds, and so on. Well, for some years, he has been making money on this in a nightclub act. And he's quite well known in Arizona, perhaps in other places. But last January, he gave the newspaper 24 prophecies for 1974. And I want to read these to you because you will recognize practically all of them are false, but there are thousands of people who believe this man, literally, and he claims his ability to prophesy is a gift from God. Well, here's his 24 prophecies of what was supposed to happen during the last months. Some of them are right, a few of them. Gas will not be rationed. Number two, the Middle East tensions will be relaxed or the problem will not be solved. Number three, an attempt will soon be made on the life of Egypt's president, perhaps successful. Number four, Pope Paul will be taken with a sudden illness about April. Number five, Manila will be struck with a terrible earthquake. Number six, unusual weather will continue to prevail all over the nation. Well, some of you older people know that every year is unusual weather, right? For all your life, every year has been unusual weather. Number seven, here's a dilly. Stock market will settle down to a steady, slow, realistic return to reason soon. The stock market has been going down, right? And it's continuing down. Number eight, there will be no real or lasting energy crisis. Number nine, Nixon will fulfill his term of office. Number ten, the purge of government officials will continue. He was even wrong there because the men who were out were already out last year and then it was over. See. Number eleven, Wallace will be much in the news. Number twelve, earthquakes will hit Southern California in May and August. Number 13, Arab nations will be fighting among themselves. Number 14, there will be an attempt on Kissinger's life. Number 15, I see the loss of a large airliner, a 747, en route to London or nearly there. Number 16, there will be unrest in Chile, Japan, Philippines, Turkey, Greece, and China with possible internal fighting. Well, there's been unrest in those nations since history has been written. On the brighter side, new oil fields will be developed here in the United States. So far, he's been right on about two or three, right? This is, I'm down to 17. 
18, the economy will be uptrended. All the news in the paper is on layoffs, right? And inflation is getting worse. Number 19, food prices will drop. Number 20, changes in income tax structure will prove kinder to the little man. 21, we will see strong moves towards socialized medicine or a similar program. 22, Kennedy will be the next president with Birch Baugh, his running mate. 23, opposing Kennedy will be Rockefeller. 24, national government will make strong moves towards ecology. Actually, as you read those, the only ones where he is at least even partially right are the kind that you and I could have made with general statements, right? And yet this man was originally a minister, claims this gift is from God, and makes money in nightclubs on ESP. Now, he's only one, and I'm afraid that thousands of Americans will follow the advice of these men, and they will buy this or buy that or do this or do that to save themselves through the preaching of those false prophets. Now, that's the kind of snares in this land. Let's continue the good news in these last few verses of Isaiah 24. Verse 19, and I'll read the word land instead of earth. The land is utterly broken down. The land is clean dissolved. The land is moved exceedingly. The land shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Now, all of the way through this, what have we been finding? It is the evil, wicked man's way upon the earth which is being destroyed, not the physical land itself. God is turning everything right side up. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth or upon the land. So the rulers and leaders who have betrayed us are the ones that will be punished. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in prison, and after many days shall they be visited. And what is going to happen? The moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. Now remember, these symbols are of Israel. We will be confounded and ashamed for our foolishness in following the ways of the heathen and the ways of Babylon, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. What is Isaiah 24? A prophecy of the destruction of the earth? Nonsense. It is a prophecy of God's destruction of the city of confusion, of our enemies, and of wickedness. A prophecy of God turning the world right side up and bringing in the kingdom of God upon the earth. Isaiah 24 is one of the most glorious chapters in the Bible. Isn't it a shame that the denominations read the first verse and tell us that means the earth is going to be destroyed? Why do they do that? They do that because God has allowed their eyes to be blinded. Now, you good people see in all of this the key to the understanding of this chapter And it's the same key that we need for the understanding of all of God's Bible is who God's people really are. So when you and I preach the truth about God's Israel people, that we are in truth His people, it is a key for opening up this word that changes this chapter from bad news to the most glorious news our people have ever seen or heard the coming in of the kingdom of Christ in this land. Praise ye the Lord. Let's stand. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this great hope and comfort that thou hast given us, that when you make this earth empty, this land empty, it will be empty of Babylon, empty of wickedness, and filled with thy kingdom. We pray that you help us. We pray that you be with us. Help us to stand in this day and not fall into the snare and into the pit. In Jesus' name, amen.